So welcome everyone to this uh, penultimate breakfast club for the Berta Five Matters. Um, if you haven't, if you haven't been to any of these, um, th this is the uh, Spring Festival for the Berta Five Matters. We're very excited um, to have Kim Scott uh, talking to us today. Um, she's going to be talking to us about um, children who are at risk of educational disadvantage and and about um, teaching writing. Um, particularly and um, she uh, this it, she's talking to us in the strand of children's funds of knowledge which has been brought to us in partnership with development map which we're really happy for um, I'm going to hand over to Kim because I know that she's got a lot um, to to share with us um, and if you as per usual, if you haven't been before, people are using the chat as like a community of practice, putting thoughts and questions um, and ideas into that, which is brilliant. Um, if you want to ask a specific question, if you can pop it in the Q&A, we'll give about five, five, ten minutes at the end of the session for um, Kim to have a go with that. So let me just formally introduce Kim. Kim Scott is an early childhood consultant with 30 years of experience of working with children, teachers and leaders. She provides consultancy, training, workshops and keynote speeches across the UK and overseas and has created her own online early years professional development platform called The Place to Learn, where her courses are available on demand to subscribers. Right, Kim, over to you. Please share your screen and go for it. OK, so hello, everybody. and um, Welcome. Yeah, this is my place to learn, which I'm quite proud of. Developed during lockdown when uh, the whole world changed. The joy of recording online training is that I can really go into depth in different areas, such as writing, as I'm talking about today. So today, the area that I'm particularly talking about is what do we do for those children, I guess, that we're more concerned about. Now, some of you who might have followed my work over the years will know that I'm a big fan of the film The Matrix. And for some time, I have been suggesting that perhaps the world of early years education, perhaps the world of education as a whole, perhaps the world appears like it's trapped in some kind of matrix at the moment. Um, it certainly feels to me more and more that we're existing in some kind of simulated reality really, um, where at the moment we seem to have been convinced that particularly for our children that need to catch up. Before COVID it was children generally at risk of educational disadvantage, um, pupil premium children in England, you know what, free school meals children, whatever we want to call them. Um, now it seems to be the post COVID catch up. This idea first of all that children need to catch up um, is, is, is of concern to me. This idea of thinking of children of disadvantage, who are disadvantaged is of concern when it's often the system that is disadvantaging them. But we seem to be existing in this sort of um, false reality where we're being convinced more and more that if we just fill these young children, particularly those from less well-off backgrounds, if we fill them full of enough literacy knowledge or maths knowledge or whatever the rest at this early age the rest of their life will just miraculously fall into place and everything will be all right now i believe firmly that providing such a, a narrow focus for young children's learning doesn't feel right to most of us and yet it can feel very very hard to escape so this morning just for a short while i'm going to ask you to take the red pill for those of you who are familiar with the film and just face some uncomfortable truths with me. And I believe that what I'm sharing with you, it won't be anything new, but I do think that sometimes we have to stand out of this matrix that we're being pushed into, saying we need to do more and more, more formally and earlier for young children. We need to step back and look at what we know and understand about young children and bring that to the forefront. So let's start with just quickly looking at writing and all that is involved in learning to write. We have all those transcriptional skills and actually so much of becoming a writer seems to be, particularly in England right now, focused on just those first two points, phonics and spelling and handwriting. We know another huge element of writing, even more important, I would say, are compositional skills, because actually, let's say, you know, when you're older, 
quite possibly, if you really, really need to, there's someone or something else can help you with your phonics and spelling and handwriting, but you need to have the ideas and the vocabulary and be able to put sentences together. I think of somebody like Stephen Hawkins, whose handwriting wasn't great there, was it? He wasn't using that and he was using systems for, for um, writing and spelling, but he had the ideas to give. But then there's this whole other area of writing that we forget. And what I am so grateful for is this wonderful document, Birth to Five Matters, that we're really here to celebrate during this festival that reminds us so much of the other things that are important. Um, just some characteristics I've drawn out here that are vital if you're going to be a writer, to be confident, to have a go, to be resilient when it goes wrong, because it's hard and it will go wrong, to persevere until you get better and better at these things. And also to have that creativity to bring your own ideas to your writing. And then of course, there's also those ex executive functions that are key to this, to um, be able to stay focused on one thing and not be distracted by others, the inhibitory control, to have that cognitive flexibility. So when you look at those aspects of a writing curriculum, and this to me is, you know, the framework of a writing curriculum, you need to be able to flip between a lot of different tasks. You need to hold an idea in your head of what you want to write. You need to put that into a sentence. You need to think about the vocabulary. You need to know where to start on the paper how to form the letters, how to leave spaces within words. You know, there is so much, so many different tasks you're flitting between. And of course, this needs a really strong working memory. Another key truth of this is if you wanna develop those things, we have an inbuilt way of doing this in the early years. And this is through play, where children naturally develop those characteristics and those executive functions. So there's really our uncomfortable truth one. If you want to improve writing, the trick is not to get children writing more earlier and earlier. The trick is to start with improving the quality of the play you provide. And that can seem kind of unintuitive if you're not an early years person, if you're leading a team and you're not really early years trained. It appears if you're leading the country in terms of education or even monitoring the quality of education, this link doesn't seem to come through as strongly as it does through the research. This is how children develop those characteristics and functions. Here's another uncomfortable truth, and we know this if you want to improve writing, the key thing you need to focus on early on is improving language. How do we do that? Do we need to take children and stick them in a darkened room and put them through lots of language programs? Well, of course we can do that, but what we know and what the research shows us is that the very best way of developing a child's language skills is to have quality back and forth interactions. And again, research shows us that that happens best and most naturally in child-led play if we interact in the right kind of way. Uh, this document from the Education Endowment Fund, it's a good document actually, it reminds us in there, but it seems to have got missed, that the best interventions in terms of languages are practices rather than programmes. Practices in terms of developing everybody's practice in the setting or the school who interacts with children. So that in a way we can all become a child speech and language therapist in everyday practice. And I think that's something that really gets missed. If you want to improve the quality of language support in your school or setting, improve the quality of adult practice. Get them learning how to interact in the very best ways with children. What's another uncomfortable truth? Oh, this one. Children at risk of educational disadvantage don't actually need a completely different teaching approach from that, which is good developmentally appropriate practice for all children. There is this view again, isn't there, that if we take these children off and do something very, very, very different, very repetitive, usually outside of playful practice with these children, this will boost them and give them what they need. This wonderful, wonderful review of um, research evidence um, that was actually put together in preparation for the EYFS to try to help inform the DfE. Unfortunately, not a great deal of notice seemed to have been taken of it, but it highlighted that the evidence of great practice for disadvantaged children are actually what all children need. There's no evidence that a different or more intense teaching approach is required. And that's what I really want to try to reassure you about, I guess, today. Because 
My concern has been for some time now, and even more post-COVID, that our attempts to, to narrow this gap between the children that have and the children that have not, our attempts to, to help children catch up post-COVID, instead of giving children the broad, balanced, wonderful curriculum that they need, in some cases, and I know not all, we are being pressured to actually give them a much more narrow curriculum. Those children I'm seeing more and more, as well as now getting up to an hour of phonics a day in the morning, may well be having half an hour in the afternoon. And I start to question any approach, any program that actually after giving what, four, five, six, seven and a half hours of intensive phonics teaching is still not quite helping achieve what, it, what the people are hoping it will achieve. I say we need to stop. We need to look at the children in front of us look at what they are bringing with them, look at what they are showing us and work with them instead of trying to work with the children that we would like them to be. And I think that really goes in any walk of life. Be with the person who's there in front of you instead of the person you'd like them to be. Accept where they are, accept what they know, accept what they can do, and then we can start to move things forward from there. Oh, I've got one more uncomfortable truth. And that is that sometimes, and this is very well-meaning, in a really desperate attempt to help our children catch up, we all want to do the right thing, but we sometimes make what is a very difficult process, learning to write, probably the hardest thing, even harder for young children. Because we take the joy out of it if we're not careful. We take the purpose out of it. We make it too hard. We try to make children do too much, too formally, too soon and we know we know from our own practice-based evidence and we also know from what we see in terms of data that it's at best pointless but at worst can really be damaging for young children in terms of how they feel about writing how they feel about themselves if you want to be good at something you need to do it an awful lot to get better and better at it you're much more likely to do something an awful lot like writing if you've fallen in love with it, if someone has shown you the purpose of it, how it can make your play better, how it's something engaging, a gift, something joyful that you can do. And I know I might sound like I'm giving another untruth, but I work frequently in reception primary one classes. And so on that do this, that when I arrive there, you know, by the summer term, Children, boys especially, are writing all over the place, indoors, outdoors, not because they're being made to, because they've seen the purpose and they've seen the joy and how it actually makes their play better. Let's just talk about Jacob for a moment. Jacob is a boy aged four years old and Jacob loves cars. Jacob is a child that we would probably consider at risk of disadvantage educationally. He would fit that bill. Um, he's living with a single mother who's on universal credit. He doesn't live in great housing, but he has a mother actually that spends a huge amount of time doing things with him and talking to him, which reminds us always of the great Charles de Forge point. It's not who you are, it's what you do with your children that counts. Not who you are as a parent, it's what you do. And that's very empowering. Jacob loves the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and he also loves bricks because his dad gave him a set for Christmas. Um, Jacob also loves a bit of mark making. You can't stop this child mark making, <laughs> although his mother wishes she could. So Jacob starts preschool and when he's at his preschool, his adults really understand what giving a great foundation for writing is about, as well as the rest of the curriculum. They know that as he draws and as he talks, if they say, I love what you're saying there, I'm going to write it down, Jacob. And they write down verbatim his talk. They know that that is showing him how talk is so valuable, how it turns into writing. They're capturing his stories so much more than just writing coming through. They also know that it's really important to give loads of large scale, you know, motor skill development and creative opportunities and the importance of being able to draw and paint on a vertical surface for muscle development. So they provide lots of that. They, they know that he loves cars and vehicles, so they provide opportunities for him to mark make with vehicles. They know the importance of phonological awareness. 
as a really important pre-phonic skill. So they support that well in his preschool with lots of, of activities and experiences around music and rhythm and rhyme and alliteration. They know that visual discrimination, visual memory is core for reading. So they play simple games. They play a version of Kim's game that they know will excite him. Kim's game with cars because he loves them. They play Kim's game with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. They play Kim's game and, and Lotto and so on with car logos. And they know this doesn't just engage Jacob, it engages lots of other children. It's developing his knowledge of print, his visual memory, his visual literacy, and he's learning lots of other skills alongside. And of course, gradually, as we know happens in that right kind of environment, environment with the right modeling and support and play opportunities, Jacob starts experimenting more and more. He's still mark making all over the place. This time you can see, you know, much more distinctive letter shapes coming through and he can mark make now on these large sheets of paper <laughs> that are constantly available with the cars and the buildings and so on. And here where he's been turning a shoebox, shoeboxes were provided with the cards, just with the cars, not with any suggestion, but just really as a bit of a provocation. And he has turned it into a car wash. And an interested adult says, hey, Jacob, do you want to make a sign for your car wash? Yeah, Jacob does want to make a sign. The adult says, we've got some labels over in the graphics area. You could use those if you like. So off he goes and makes his sign car wash. You can see that Jacob is learning what mark making is about, what early writing is about and how it improves his play. Then Jacob goes to reception. He has a lovely, lovely reception teacher. Um, but in this school, there's a great worry about children catching up. And the reception teacher in this school is kind of pressured by the senior leadership team and their Jew and Ofsted, pressured a lot into moving children forward, catch up, catch up, catch up. And this lovely reception teacher feels pressurized into introducing ways of writing that perhaps aren't what she would normally choose to do. In writing, in reception, writing for Jacob becomes much more about things like this, rehearsing handwriting for his name with no apparent reason. He looks like he's doing quite well, doesn't he? Until we see there. I mean, this is a hilarious example in a way, if it wasn't so sad, of a child actually making less progress in a session rather than moving forward. I like to wonder what happened midway through that sheet. Did Jacob see the door to the outside open up? Did someone start playing with his model that he'd been dragged away from to practice writing his name over and over? We can only conjecture, can't we? Writing and reading in this reception class have become about memorizing out of context. And Jacob's struggling. They've become about worksheets and practicing writing letters. Jacob is struggling. He's become a can I go now child already. And we, we know what happens when a child starts saying, can I go now? Um, we know that they're not engaged and therefore anything we're really doing with them is a bit of a waste of time following that. By the end of reception, Jacob hasn't quite achieved the potential of that wonderful mark maker we had at the beginning. We can see that the writing doesn't look kind of natural and flowing. It looks painful. And any of you who work with children of this age, you can just see that Jacob probably isn't choosing to write a lot when he doesn't have to. And therefore he's not practicing and he's not getting better. By the time he enters year one, he's really in yet again in the intervention group and things haven't quite worked out in terms of writing as we thought. And he's really become pretty switched off. So system failure if we're thinking back to the matrix, what's gone on here? Is it the issue with Jacob? Did he just not work hard enough? Did he just not get engaged? Or sadly, and this is not about beating up teachers, it's about looking at the system. Did the system fail Jacob already at this early age whilst trying to do exactly what it was meant to do and introduce him to a world of being wonderfully literate? What's prevented him from this young boy who couldn't stop mark making from achieving well as a young writer? I think Lillian Katz would call this the damage disposition hypothesis. The fact that the instructional processes by which Jacob was being taught were actually damaging his dispositions to ever want to use those knowledge and skills. 
Um, we talk about it all the time in the early years, but it can't be emphasized enough that engagement in what you are doing is so important for gaining new knowledge and consolidating that knowledge. This isn't just a theory. Um, the science of learning tells us this, that the brain needs engagement as well as new knowledge and as well as an opportunity to um, consolidate and practice that knowledge. You can't avoid the engagement part. It's all about our dopamine, our reward systems. If we find something rewarding, we want to do it again and again. When we do things again and again on a voluntary basis because we love them, we get better at them. You only have to look at children like my daughter who's autistic, her special interests because she loves them, she does them again and again, and she got so good at them that she's had you know, four books published. If you love something, you'll do it again. So we have to make children love writing. And for that, we have to make it matter to them. Otherwise we fall in to this developmentally inappropriate practice. And when we fall in a dip, that's a real issue for children because it's very hard to get out of it again. So let's have a quick look at Jacob's funds of knowledge and what we might have done with that in reception class. Now funds of knowledge, as this whole strand is about that, I'm gonna give a very simplistic explanation. I would say it's the knowledge that children bring with them from their families, from their communities, from their previous settings. It's what they bring with them when they come to you. And part of that, a big part of that will often be their engagement with popular culture. There indeed is my 14 year old daughter being Snow Rambo when she was four. Popular culture is just one fund of knowledge that children often bring with them, but they often bring a lot of knowledge around it. And as you could see from Jacob, these were his real drivers. Pat Thompson talked about children coming to us with this virtual backpack, this virtual school bag, and in it is it's full of all these things that they've already learned at home. Some we might see as positive, some not so, but there will be lots in there. Things they've learned with their friends from the world in which they live. And it's the culture of the setting, the culture of the school that determines whether that child ever gets to open up their virtual school bag and share and build upon what's in there. And if we have a very firm fixed curriculum that doesn't allow for building on what children bring with them and what they already do, we do them a huge disservice. And I do not accept anyone saying these children don't come with any interests. You're just not looking deeply enough for them because all children have them, or maybe you're not valuing what their interests are. We know, for example, that Jacob had an interest, he loved cars. We can build on these experiences, but we can also use them to introduce children to things that they don't even know they're interested in yet because they haven't experienced them. So for example, instead of making Jacob write his name over and over again for no particular reason, which for him wasn't engaging, and isn't it interesting how the children who are least likely to be engaged by those sorts of experiences are the ones I see most often having to do them. How simple it is to turn that around Make yourself a name label when you come in. Now look at the difference in challenge here because this means something, it feels purposeful, it feels novel. And the human brain is developed to tune in to things that feel novel and make us be intrigued by them and want to do them again and again. And that doesn't mean we have to come in, you know, dressed as Spider-Man every day. It means the simple things like a sticky label, write your name for a purpose. You can see here, how Ali Kim came back again and again and again until he managed to get his name on that label. This is real challenge. When children choose to challenge themselves, that's when we're getting it right, when we've created an environment where that happens. Um, so instead of providing those sort of disembedded tasks for children to perform for us, let's think about what makes writing matter to young children? And a couple of simple questions that I use for this. What do children that we're concerned about particularly already know and love? What do I want them to learn? How can I combine the two? How simple is that? But so often at the moment, we're focused on what we want them to learn and we forget to think about what do children already know and love. That's our assessment really, isn't it? And there's many ways that we find that out. 
So for example, with Jacob, here's just some really simple examples. I mean, I have a lot more depth around this in my kind of online training, but we might have built, we might have built on that love of kind of mark making related to cars, giving him more opportunities for drawing. I cannot think of a better way of developing pencil control you know, when you've built up a lot of gross and fine motor skills than drawing. It's a natural way of doing it. Um, you know, gradually it, adults might have talked to him about what was in his map. They might have scribed for him. He, um, here, actually, this adult, this child did the writing first because some sort of phonics knowledge was starting to develop. They might introduce, you know, print for real meaning into the sort of play that children like Jacob liked. Here, um, in this school I was working with up in near Middlesbrough, they took photos of every child's road name. Your road names seem to mean a lot to you when you're four. And actually they were just here for play, but children were so engaged by these. They started sorting themselves according to which roads they lived in. I couldn't put that on here for data protection reasons. And of course, when you provide the opportunities and it makes sense, children are usually keen to have a go at doing these things themselves. And here, by the end of this reception class, children don't need an adult to suggest that they make their own signs and apply what they're learning. Look at the quality of the writing here. It has built up because it has made sense. The things that children are learning in those phonics sessions, those short, sharp phonics sessions that they had in these, this class, they are applying all of the time and practicing and getting better at. And this really is why I believe the borough that I worked in for 15 years, Lewisham, um, where so much of the writing was being really done through play and playful experiences. For many years, those children got the highest outcomes in the country, despite coming in with low, low um, on entry levels. And it was the area in the country where consistently children at risk of educational disadvantage gained the highest outcomes. Fascinatingly and sadly, Ofsted never came to do a thematic study there. I'll never know why. Um, so we have to make writing matter to young children. So let's just think about this. What makes things matter? Um, if you take a second now to think back to your first algebra test at secondary school, say, what do you remember about that? I'm guessing that unless it was very, very painful for you because you didn't do very well in it or tra very traumatic or, or unless you did exceptionally well, you probably don't remember much about your first maths test, say at secondary school. Now take a minute to think about your first kiss. I bet if I had you in front of me now, I bet a lot more of you would be giggling and you would remember that more. Why? Because it mattered. We know um, from neuroscience that we know that when something matters, when something um, emotionally engages us both negatively or positively, those memories seem to be laid down much firmer in the brain. That can be a good thing, of course, or it can be a negative thing. When it comes to learning, we need to make sure we're laying down really positive memories. And the more we make writing matter to children, the more memorable it becomes to them, the more they do it the more embedded it is in the brain. So if we're talking about learning and memory, as Ofsted in, in England seem to be, you know, doing an awful lot, then okay, let's think about what makes learning memorable for young children. And believe it or not, it's not sitting down learning things by rote. Of course, repeating things makes it memorable, but it's how you repeat them. It's the purposes, the ways in which you repeat them that makes such a difference. And it's not always about play. Adult-led activities are important too at times, but when they are playful, when they engage and motivate children. I talk about play and playful learning, and I do not believe there is a place for anything but those two in the early years, and I would argue actually throughout primary. If what you're doing in terms of adult-led learning is not playful, engaging and motivating, then please don't do it anymore or find a way to make it playful, engaging and motivating. So if I were to ask you to think about the children that you've worked with, when they mark, make or write as part of their play, what are the things they want to make or write about? This is part of your curriculum for writing. Let's talk through a few. I know that children write to connect with those that matter to them, whether it's a card for Mother's Day, 
um, or it's a letter to somebody. Kathy Nut Brown reminded us that print is only really meaningful for children if it's used in a relationship with other people. The first people that children want to connect with in their writing is usually their parents, their friends, their pet, or you. Do we maximize this enough? Or do we say, everybody today in reception class, we've read the three bears, we're all gonna write a letter to the three bears from Goldilocks to say sorry. Why? You're asking children to put themselves in the position of someone else, which is really hard, and to write as someone else. You've given them very little choice in the matter. Why not say, I thought we could write a letter together. Who should we write it to? Um, we could write it to the head teacher to say, thank you for letting us buy that new box of construction, whatever. Um, give more agency. And then say, you know, we're going to write, if this is how you do your writing, you do do it in adult led way, and I know different people do it in different ways, then just think about how you can give more agency, broaden it. We're going to write a letter today. Who are you writing your letters to? You're writing your letter to your mum again. You wrote a letter to your mum last week. What are you going to tell her about this week? Are you going to put a poem in there or a map or a little book? Um, even if you work in a very, very structured way with lots of, you know, adult led small groups, you can still make this playful and engaging. So if we look at, see how the playful stuff, the play informs the adult led rather than it always being vice versa. Okay, I'm whizzing on. Children write to connect with others. They write party invitations. These are the natural texts of children. They love to share their expertise in an area. So making books, for example, and this doesn't mean that they have to do all the work. If they haven't got the physical skills, you scribe for them. Like these two who had made a pair of shoes. So these information books are always available in this um, nursery in Westminster. Um, when I was in Singapore, so many signs everywhere. And it made me laugh that when the children chose to write of their own accord, they often wrote signs. But children quite are up for that, writing to give information to others, like do not come in here. Or there's a spider, nobody kill this spider, don't die the spider, be quiet because the spider's living in the drain. Because this emotionally matters to these children, this spider mattered, they wanted to give information about him to keep him safe. Year one, when they're playing with the um, small world, they're writing signs about the zoo animals. So this doesn't have to stop at the end of the early years. Sometimes children will just write because the novelty interests them. That's the sticky labels, the different pens, all those sorts of things that will often engage them. But they often write to enhance their play. And one example I see of this is maps so often. Uh, from nursery to reception. Why don't we maximize this? Why don't we work so much more around these texts that children are telling us they love? As you can see from this, this is not about holding children's writing development back. It's about actually improving it. Now there's the whole question of whether we should be doing this with children as young as four and five, just because we can doesn't mean we should. I'm afraid certainly in England at the moment, this is a question that is not really helpful to go into because our hands are a bit tied, but I think it's always something to put out there. At least we can do it with joy. Children will also write because it helps them achieve the goal. Like this child wants to get stuff together for woodwork. So they're making a simple plan that the adult's scribing. This child in the nursery wants things for Christmas for Santa. So is happy <laughs> to talk about and mark and compose what she wants. This child, please can we have some boxes and some plastic for our rocket? They're making a rocket, they're writing to the office so they can get the boxes. I love this. This child who's a bit older was writing what he wanted to achieve in life. He wanted to be, this is year one, he wanted to be in the England rugby team. He wanted to throw Everard in a ditch, but Evelyn in a ditch, but that got crossed out because he thought better of it. He wanted to get a Lamborghini to be England rugby captain, to win a World Cup, to get a mansion and to tie his shoelaces. What a wonderful ambition. And then children also write because they want to mimic adults, the adults around them. This was during a general election many years ago and um, you can see what they're mimicking here, the old reward charts. I wouldn't want to be Imogen at the top, but I definitely wouldn't want to be David Cameron and UKIP at the bottom there. Um, Lewisham was a very lefty borough. So, when you're thinking about your writing curriculum for all children, I would say, but most especially for those children that we want to engage more with writing, perhaps those children that we're being told we need to help catch up, think about what matters to them. This isn't rocket science, is it? But it is brain science.
Think about where your practice currently falls. Is there anything you'd like to change a little? What are the barriers to this and how can you start addressing them? What's within your control? Often it's conversations with senior leaders. I would say always focus the conversation on children and outcomes for children and how you want to make them better, not worse. And let's finish with this lovely piece of writing. Um, and this is what happens when a child becomes engaged and they write because they find it joyful. I did some things in Italy, South London, isn't it? I had a great holiday and I am so happy. What we all know is the path that we should be taking, I believe. What we just have to make sure is that we try as hard as possible to stay on that path and not be driven off it by others in our ear. Keep calm and let's get the hell out of this matrix. Thank you very much, everybody. Oh, thank you. Um, that was amazing, Kim. Amazing. <laughs> there's been some amazing comments and there's a couple of questions, actually. I just want to clarify for everyone. Yes, it was inspiring stuff. Yes, the video is going to be made available. I think some very kind people have put um, the YouTube link into the chat. Um, I will be emailing out um, that link to everyone who's gone in through Eventbrite. It's already gone out to for the first week and it'll be going out all the all the videos will be available till the 13th of march and we are really wanting people to share them with their teams share them with your head teachers share them with all your teams share them with your colleagues share them as broadly as you can and use them for your cpd so please go ahead with that now i think we've got a few minutes and we have some questions okay it was amazing and incredible and we I think that's great right so I've got two questions that have actually been put in the Q&A. So you've got, you've got about two minutes on each question, right? Okay. Um, so uh, I, uh, uh, Shana has said, I have a few autistic children that have incredible ideas and good language, but really struggle with writing because of the difficulties with working men memory or um, inability and focus skills and therefore lose confidence and resilience. How can I help them? It makes me sad that their cre cre creativity and ideas aren't valued as much as if they were written down write for them, be their scribe, be their yes. scribe, absolutely. And of course, along the way, you're focusing on gradually building up concentration. I firmly believe the best way of building a child's concentration is to provide things worth concentrating on. And I, I think um, as the parent of an autistic child, which doesn't make me an absolute expert, but I have learned through watching that they will focus on something if it has meaning and purpose and if it helps them in achieving some of their goals around their special interests as well. Um, and it, my daughter really doesn't like writing, believe it or not, but because she wanted to share with the world about how it felt to be autistic, she wrote a piece that went viral. That's how she got the book deal. She didn't write to loads of publishers, but it was about the thing <coughs> about so so often in schools we're trying to steer children away from those special interests instead of building upon them and I, I actually think that is absolutely wrong ask any autistic adult about what it's like to be taken away from your special interest the thing that drives you that you're amazing at so build on that scribe for them but then as Anna F Grave you know often shows gradually hand over responsibility you know that word why don't you have a go at writing that one you know, take the pressure off, allow their ideas to flow. And I call it an apprenticeship approach, really, to them taking that over. Very quick answer. OK, no, that's a really good answer. Um, someone's just asked, when will the videos be available until 13th of May? They'll be available from six weeks from the end of the conference, 13th of May. Uh, right. Next question. You've got two more now. Uh, Kim, I'm tutoring a five year old. He's really keen on space. Can I have some ideas for engaging him with writing? Maybe a space map, a space story. What are your thoughts? You've got about a minute on that one. Oh, gosh. Well, that's putting me on. Um, if he's really <laughs> lovely, I, I have found this is just something to try. But share when a child shares their expertise in any area, it builds their self-esteem. It, it um it creates great conversations because you are asking them questions that are genuine and meaningful. How does this happen? How does that work? Why not? I don't normally just put out activity ideas like that, but why not talk about, it'd be really, you know so much about space and you love it so much. Why don't we make a book that we can share with others? What would you put in it? Fantastic. That is an amazing answer. Last question, Lolita. Uh, how do you advise that we give feedback on writing on letter formation and spelling? Oh, that's a Children. good question. Um, I say do it in the moment. You can tell I'm good friends with Anna F. Gray. Do it in the moment when it makes sense. 
I'm actually a great believer of giving children information that is helpful to them. I say it's a bit like if you go around with spinach on your teeth, you actually want to know you've got it on your teeth, right? So if a child who is reasonably confident in play is remark making something they've shown or writing, I would say, I'm only talking about this when children are really starting to get into writing um, and they're bringing you something. I've, I show a lot of examples like a child that's written cup and they've done it with a K you know that child if it's the first time they've done something like this your response is amazing more of the same but something I do personally is I say oh that's a, I love what you did there shall I tell you something funny that is actually a curly cur at the beginning of cup not a whatever it is kicking cur I never say go and write that again go and change it but shall I tell you over and over again children often I see I come back and they've changed it to yeah. me this is given information in the moment when it's helpful, but there's a real health warning with this, because, of course, if you do this all the time and you don't do it in the right way and you make it a chore, <coughs> giving a new bit of information that's helpful, you're criticising and correcting and it will put children off coming to you. If you do it in the right way, we, we give the information when it matters. That's what I'd suggest. Right. That's fantastic. We're going to have to wrap up now. You've been amazing, Kim. Oh, thank you. There's some amazing things in the in the chat. I'm very inspiring. Everyone's saying that. So for anyone who hasn't had to dash off to go and start teaching, just to let you know, the Lunchtime Club is the amazing Di Chilvers. Um, she's going to be joining us at 12 o'clock today. You're very welcome to join us. And in fact, you'll be more than welcome to join us. And this evening, um, Pete Morehouse is going to be talking about his creativity matters. So we've got a really great day. Um, Kim, can I just say thank you very much? That was tremendous. And goodbye to everyone and thank you for joining us. Thanks. I'm looking forward to seeing my friends on later today, Di and Pete. <laughs> thank you, thank you for much. having me, everybody. And thanks for your lovely comments.